Lovely, thank you. Well, thank you for everyone um, who has joined us so far and thank you to our lovely panellists for being here today. Um, and welcome to today's event, uh, Women in Film, The Changing Landscape, which is going to be a keynote and a panel discussion. My name is Holly and my pronouns are she, her. I um, have blonde hair and blue eyes and I'm wearing a red stripy top. And my virtual background is um, Thelma and Louise, which is what this whole event series is, is uh, inspired by. I chose this one because I feel like I look like a bit like a part of the gang kind of in the middle of the two women. <laughs> Um, so I just want to tell you a bit more about Trailblazing Women, if this is the first time at one of the events. Um, Trailblazing Women on and off screen is an international event series hosted by women in screen and research and enterprise in the School of Arts and Creative Industries at London South Bank University. This is our fourth year um, and our first online and we are thrilled to be celebrating the 30th anniversary of the UK release of the iconic film Thelma and Louise. In association, um, with, fantastically, with the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media. As always, we'll be blending practice and theory to bring film uh, to bring the film industry and the academy together through keynotes, panels, screenings, uh, and practical masterclasses. Um, if you'd like to know more about the full program of events, we're going to put the link in the chat, um, so you can click on that and see what other events that we have coming up tomorrow. We do have two brilliant masterclasses being run tomorrow. Um, as Neil has already mentioned, please do follow us on Twitter. Um, we've put all our handles in the chat and we're trying to use the hashtag Thelma Louise 30. So do feel free to live tweet during the event or after the event. Um, that would be brilliant. We are very excited to have some fantastic and very accomplished women on our panel today. Um, and we are going to introduce them shortly, but first we're just gonna do a couple of virtual housekeeping, um, including LSBU's respect and dignity statement. So everyone speaking at or attending an LSB event, whether in person or virtually, should be treated with respect, dignity and courtesy. LSBU operates in an environment built on equality and inclusion and acceptance. We, we value contributions, feedback and comments and wish to create a space for sharing, learning, celebrating and bringing communities together. LSBU does not tolerate any form of bullying, abuse, harassment or discrimination. Inappropriate behaviour, including a behaviour that potentially impacts or contradicts LSBU's reputation and values, will be treated seriously and acted upon. Anyone exhibiting any example of this behaviour will also be removed from the webinar. We want our events to be enjoyable, safe and warm experience for all. Thank you for adhering to these guidelines. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Neil, who's just going to take us through some of the technical requirements. Hi everyone, my name is Neil hudson Basing. I'm the Corporate Events Manager for LSBU. My pronouns are he, him. Um, I am a blonde man with green eyes. I'm wearing a floral shirt and glasses. Um, just to take you through the Zoom functionality, um, it's great to see people using the chat box already. Please continue to do so to share your thoughts and comments and keep your intros coming in. Let us know who you are, what you do and where you're joining us from. In the absence of seeing you face to face, it's lovely to know who our audience are. Uh, we'd like to encourage you to distinguish between the Q&A box and the chat box. Um, if you pop your questions in the Q&A box, that means we can work our way through them and we won't lose them in the chat box. Please do let us know who your question's for. Um, if it's for everyone, please put question for all. And you can also upvote on the questions you most want answered by clicking the thumbs up symbols in there and that boosts them to the top. Um, you'll also notice that I have enabled closed captioning, which are the subtitles that you can see appearing on your screen. If you wish to hide those, you can click on the little up arrow next to the CC live transcript button um, and you can click on hide subtitles. But in the interest of inclusivity and accessibility, we do like to keep those enabled. And finally, as Holly said, please share your thoughts and comments on Twitter. I'm going to be sharing the hashtag and Twitter handle in the chat box throughout, as well as other links, things that people say I'll, I'll, I'll catch up on um, and feature them in there as well. Um, I'm in the background if you have any further questions at all. That's all from me. Thank you. Lovely. I think we'll hand over to Lucy now. Thank you so much, everyone. So my name is Lucy Brown and I'm an associate professor and the head of division at film for um, London South Bank University. I have long brown curly hair and hazel eyes, and it gives me huge pleasure to, um, to have these special panelists in front of us here today and to have 
the keynote um, with Madeline De Nono. Um, Madeline ha is the CEO and president of the Gina Davis Institute on Gender in Media, and that is the global leading um, expert, really driving the research around media representation in the entertainment and media industry. So we're, we're thrilled uh, that Madeline is here to join us. And really this, um, this conference and, and this session is about the, obviously the eponymous uh, Gina Davis set up uh, the Institute in 2004. Um, and she talks about this, you know, starring in Thelma and Louise, this film, which was released 30 years ago now um, in the UK, 30, 30 years ago to the day. Um, and that being the sort of inspiration for her for setting up this institute because she saw that there weren't the opportunities for women on screen or behind the or behind the scenes and, and really wanted to make a difference and what a difference um, that organization has made and this is why we're really thrilled to be bringing the conference our fourth one um, in association with um, the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media so without any further ado I will um, pass over to Madeline who will do a, a brief description of her herself and and uh, she's she's got an amazing background and um, and she will be giving a keynote so thank you so much Madeline for being here thank you Lucy it's a thrill to be here and I also want to thank uh, Melanie Hoyes for also bringing me into this and she's a wonderful council chair for us um, for the institute so I just want to give a shout out to Melanie uh, my pronouns are she and her I have curly brown hair sometimes extremely curly, depending on the weather, and I am wearing a black shirt. And before we begin today, I'm going to be actually be sharing my screen. I would like to acknowledge that I am currently on the traditional lands of the Chumash peoples. And although we were meeting today on a virtual platform, we're all connected by the ground beneath our feet, which where I am is historically the home of indigenous people. So now I am going to take a beat. I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna open up. So what um, Lucy and Holly asked me to do today is to put together kind of a mashup um, of data. So that is what I have um, for you today. And um, Lucy had mentioned, uh, Lucy had mentioned, I'm just gonna move this box over here. Lucy had mentioned um, a little bit about who we are, but for those of you who may not be as familiar, you know, clearly, you know, on the heels of the anniversary of, you know, Thelma and Louise, Thelma and Louise really changed Gina's life and it gave her a heightened awareness of how women and girls would feel about her playing a certain role. And not only with Thelma and Louise, but also with the League of Their Own and a few others, she kind of took that you know, with her and that kind of informed um, her decisions moving forward. So it was when she became a mom and she was the mom of a very young daughter, like any parent, she started watching programming, little kids programming with her daughter and she was struck by the lack of female presence. And in her questioning, she thought, how is this possible? We're in the 21st century. How is it that I'm not seeing a lot of female presence in the programming that I'm showing my young daughter? What is the message that we're sending to children, boys and girls, if female characters aren't really having much prominence? And so she started by, talking to friends to say, hey, did you notice in this show that there wasn't a lot of female characters and people would say to her, no, I didn't notice. And when she'd be meeting with studio heads or producers about potential acting jobs, she would have the same question. And they'd say, no, well, we have this character, we have that character. And what they were doing is they were only referring to one single female character in the entirety of either the movie or the TV show. And so she decided that she needed the data. So she thought about this idea in 2003 and then in 2004 organized, raised a lot of money. And then uh, it took about two and a half years for the first study to come out. 
And then she realized that it was true. And at that time, uh, if you were to ask somebody, you know, what their definition of diversity was, clearly gender was not on the agenda. So that is one of the things that through Gina's vision um, that we have put forth and not only just gender, but we look at intersectionality. And so speaking of which, what you're gonna see today is there's six key dimensions that we apply to our research. So we look at the intersectionality of gender, race, LGBTQIA, ability, age, um, and body type. <clears throat> so now I'm gonna walk you through um, two different studies. Uh, so the first study that I'm gonna talk about is, you know, given, you know, there are two pandemics, you know, there's the, you know, COVID pandemic that we've been dealing with. And then there's also the pandemic and the fight against racial, you know, injustice. And so this first study is a deep dive looking at, you know, black um, female leads and black female, you know, characters in film and television. And this is out of the um, US. So there's been um, a lot of tropes and stereotypes embedded in how uh, black women in Hollywood are represented in terms of fictional female characters. Historically, there were three key stereotypes. The mammy trope, this was a woman who was always in charge of the slave owner's children. Uh, she didn't even have a name. Um, you know, the Jezebel was a woman that used her, you know, sexuality to advance, you know, her agenda. And then these tropes and stereotypes have taken themselves all the way from the 20th century into the 21st century. And there are a lot of tropes and stereotypes that we're still dealing with, like the strong black woman, the angry black woman, you know, et cetera. Uh, so first of all, uh, when we looked at uh, the percentage of black female characters in terms of leading characters, over the past decade, they're only 3.7%. Uh, skin tone is something that we've really looked into. And what we have found is that when it comes to skin tones, first of all, we have found that uh, male characters have, and, and male characters that are people of color have a full spectrum of skin tones from light to dark. But what we did find is that there were very few um, female characters, fictional characters that had a darker skin tone, as you can see here. Uh, in terms of hairstyles, uh, what we have also noticed is that most of these fictional female characters are relegated to what we call um, European standards, you know, of beauty um, and not being able to express, you know, a natural, you know, hair look. And this is something that we have found to be, you know, consistent. In terms of overall, we're gonna talk about films. What we have found is that black women and girls in the US population are about 6.5%. People of color in the US are about 38%. And clearly, depending on where you are in the world, it changes, you know, dramatically, whether in, you're in the UK, you know, or you're in, you know, South Africa. And what we have found is that Black female leads in film are about 5.7% and Black female characters um, overall are about 6.1%. So there's um, an almost equitable you know, rep representation, but the thing you have to think about is even though we use the population as a baseline, we're talking about the world of make-believe. So uh, those are really low you know, hanging bars. Um, and again, here you can see in terms of the percentage of the top 100 family films. So these are the largest grossing films um, out of the United States. Uh, you can see again, you know, only 10% are black female leads versus, you know, white female leads. Uh, in terms of leadership, um, you can see that there was more of a distribution in terms of being shown as a leader, um, in terms of black women versus other women of color versus white women. Um, in terms of violence, uh, we saw that black 
fictional female characters were more likely to be shown as violent. Um, and when it comes to objectification, clearly um, black female characters were six times more likely to be sexually you know, ob objectified. Um, sexual objectification is something that uh, we've always noticed. And particularly one of the things that I had mentioned is that we're looking at what we categorize in the United States as family films. So to have any of these numbers be present is problematic. In terms of intersectional, like I said, we look at the intersection of not only gender, um, but race, age, ability. And you can see that, you know, although uh, people who are 50 plus or 34% of the US population, it's only 11.5% uh, for black female characters. Uh, in terms of LGBTQIA, you know, abilities, uh, these numbers are really, you know, glacial um, compared to, you know, the population. So I'm going to move forward. And, and I just do want to make a mention, and maybe Lucy or Holly, we can put this um, in, in the chat. All of these studies uh, are available. We have full extensive reports are available for free on our website for those of you who want to learn more about it. So we were really, really privileged to work with TENA um, and we were able to conduct um, this global study uh, looking at age and the title is Frail, Frumpy and Forgotten. Uh, and this was looking at the portrayal of women 50 plus in film. Um, around the world. And uh, this was a combination of our research team and also we used uh, the GDIQ, which I'll take a minute to explain that. So we have kind of a hybrid methodology. Um, we have developed uh, the GDIQ, which affectionately Gina Davis Inclusion Quotient, which was uh, funded by Google and it was developed for us uh, in partnership with Dr. Sri Narayan at the USC uh, Viterbi School of Engineering, along with our human expert coding team. And the GDIQ allows us to automate and extract from, from moving images, a uh, gender screen and speaking time, which is really important. Um, and then for the rest of the data points, we use our human expert coding team. So for this investigation, we looked at about 1,200 uh, characters from uh, the largest grossing films in uh, Germany, France, the UK, um, in, and the US. Um, and clearly, uh, people ages 50 plus or 28% um, of the population. But again, when we looked at all these characters, they were only about 22%. When I mentioned screen and speaking time and why this is so important. So it's one thing to say, okay, we're gonna count on our hand how many characters there are, but it's something else to say, are they you know, prominent? And what we found is that you know, characters ages 50 plus, they only make up 17% you know, of the screen time at 21%. Um, of the speaking time, which means that even if they are a, a character that is contributing to a lot of dialogue, we're not seeing them. The camera is just not pointing at them. I'm gonna move this over here. Here we go. Um, so in terms of older adults and, and stereotypes, um, so 50, what we found is 56.9% of the characters were 50 plus. Um, and we found that they were um, embedded with a lot of tropes and stereotypes in terms of being cranky and unattractive, unfashionable. Um, and they are many cases, the brunt of, of the joke. Um, they don't have a love life. Um, they are less likely to be depicted in any kind of you know, romantic you know, capability. Um, they're more often depicted as being, you know, alone. And when it comes to female characters, 
um, they are vastly, vastly represented. So female characters make up only 25% of the characters 50 plus. Um, zero, this is like zero, big zero percent of these leads um, are females 50 plus. And here's the thing, when you look at in the real world, you know, women who are in their 50s um, are the healthiest and the wealthiest um, and have the most discretionary income. Uh, also, we look at these other stereotypes of female characters ages 50 plus or more likely to be shown as senile, as homebound, as feeble, frumpy, and I mean, seven times more likely to be shown as, as homebound. It's ridiculous. Um, and uh, we came up with this ageless test and only one in four films passed the ageless test. Um, so you could see that clearly they were stereotyped um, or just not you know, present um, at all. So this intervention slide is a little more general because we know that not everybody on the call may be in film per se, but when we look at you know, advertising, you know, it starts with the script, the words, the creative briefs, um, you know, take a pass at it. It's very simple to say, hey, let me just look at these characters. How many characters do I have? Are these characters contributing to dialogue? If they are, what are they doing? Where are they being placed? If it's a female character, she always being placed in a domestic you know, situation. If it's a person of color, are they relegated to a service position? Is there a balance of showing people of color as leaders as well as you know, other positions? Um, when there are crowds or group scenes, make sure that it is 50% female. And of course, when it comes to hiring, which we determine is more of a conscious bias, really make sure that you have a diverse composition. So that is it um, for me. And what I'm going to do is end this and stop sharing my screen. And I will turn it back over to Lucy. Thank you very much. Hi there, sorry, <laughs> I was just trying to get my, um, get this back on. Um, thank you so much, Madeline. That was amazing and really fascinating. It just goes to show, you know, that, um, well, obviously the importance of research like this, it actually shows the data because as we know, there's some sort of fascinating um, Films and it often feels like we're we're making these leaps at times where there's some fantastic uh, films or TV programs uh, with um, starring and, and lead led by black women or you know and white women and women of all all types. Um, but at the same time, by drilling down into that research, we still see the problems, and, it, and that leads me to really to the first question that I'd like to throw uh, to yourself, and then I'll throw on to to the panel as well. But obviously after Thelma and Louise, people did think that change would come. Um, you know, that this film really inspired uh, so many people and, and, and the thinking was that there'd be a lot more um, films, you know, written by the likes of, of Kali Cooley who wrote um, Thelma and Louise. Uh, but actually it didn't really happen, did it like that? And, um, you know, why do you think that progress is so slow? So I'll go to you, Madeline, first, and then we'll introduce the panel. Sure. So I would say that we've seen a lot of progress on the television side versus on the film side. And you really need to think about the numbers. So, you know, the United States may produce four to 500 films, forget, you know, COVID, which has disrupted everything. Um, but when you look at television, and now you look at the new age of television, which is streaming, I mean, all of us, I'm sure, have so many programs in our queues that we can't keep up with it. So imagine if you take a typical streaming or television show, there's a multiple of episodes. That means there's a multitude of characters. There may be your main characters, but there's an opportunity for a lot of other characters to come in and out of the show. And there's an opportunity to have multiple directors you know, look at what Ava DuVernay, Melissa Rosenberg, you know, people have done where they have hired 
different female directors for each and every you know, episode. So there's an, a much more opportunity and you see much more movement on the television side than on the film side. And also there's the physical production of it uh, which our panelists can talk about. You know, a movie could take anywhere from two to five years, sometimes 10 years to find its way to an audience where on the te television side, they're producing television you know, every, you know, every week, particularly if it's, you know, episodic. So we do see movement. And on that note, we were very pleased that even though we've only been around since 2004, which isn't a long time when you think about social impact, when you think about behavior change, nonprofit. But what we found in 2019 and 2020 is that we had achieved gender parity for female lead characters in both a family film and television. So for us, you know, and for Gina, it proved out our theory of change can work by having the data and putting it in front of, you know, creative executives um, that they can take a note from it and incorporate it, you know, in, in their work that it, it does work. Um, and we have seen movement in the United States when, it be, when, you know, towards, you know, people of color, but when it really comes to the intersectionality of ability, LGBTQIA, you know, age 50 plus that we've just seen, um, even body type, we have such a long, long way to go. That's that's fantastic. Thank you, Madeline. I'm now going to uh, introduce our um, panelists. It's fantastic to have everyone um, join us. We've got a, a brilliant lineup. Uh, it, first of all, I'll go over to. I'm just looking at my screen here. So if I can go over to Helen, um, can you introduce yourself and 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 say a few words about your background in relation to film? Uh, sure. Yeah, my name is Helen O'Hara. Um, I'm uh, vampirically white, blue-eyed, dark-haired. Um, I'm here in London. Hello. Um, and yes, I'm a film journalist and an author. Uh, I've just written a book uh, called Women vs. Hollywood, which is all about exactly these issues. And yeah, I, I just like to sort of co-sign everything Madeline said, because I think that's that's a big, big part of what's driving change. I think the fact that the Gene Davis Institute and, and others like, you know, the Annenberg Inclusion Initiative and, and the San Diego uh, Center for the Study of Women in Film and TV. I think I've got that right. Um, you know, they're coming up with the data. They have the receipts. They can show that there is a problem, that there is an imbalance. And there have been all of these comforting kind of myths in Hollywood for, for decades, for a century, really, at this point, saying that, oh, you know, films with made by women don't sell, films starring women don't sell older women can't open a film uh, black men can't open a film black women can't open a film I mean that doesn't even seem to come up in some of these discussions but th these are the kind of myths that have just been accepted as truth in Hollywood for years and it's that kind of data and this outcry on social media that that keeps this this bubbling away that I think is forcing film companies to to reconsider some of that and and what's also hap helping is that we've had very high profile examples disproving those myths. And that's been, because they weren't, those weren't allowed before. They were not, the myths were so strong that, you know, until what, 2014, Marvel, let's say, wouldn't make a film with a female lead with a black man in the lead. And so it was only when certain parties were shifted sideways, let's be honest, um, that for example, that studio started trying to experiment with things and found, oh, look, we've got a billion dollar hit on our hands, you know? So it's it's those kind of things. I'm not saying that those are the, the drivers of change because, you know, the big budget films are always the last to act and they're acting on on the basis of, you know, grassroots movements that's been, that have been going on for decades. But those are the ones that catch the headlines and those are the ones that might actually convince the sort of studio heads to, to really examine those myths and really take them apart. And I think that has been a big, big help. But I think what's what's really doing the work is the fact that, you know, people are coming up proving themselves. They're finally getting the chance to prove themselves. And they are like seizing that with both hands and just forcing Hollywood in particular to change. And that's been really exciting to see. We're only at the very first steps of this journey, but it is, there has been, I think, a fundamental shift in the past 10 years in just dismantling so much of this perceived wisdom and taking it apart. Fantastic answer, thank you. And, and now um, I'll, I'll move to Louisa. Louisa, could you introduce yourself and, and what are your thoughts on why progress 
has, has been slow. Hi, my name is Louisa Fung. I go by she, her. I am um, East Asian with short black brown hair and brown eyes. Um, I'm calling, I'm in from Vancouver, Canada, but I'm actually in Whistler and I'd like to do a quick light acknowledgement that we are in the unceded territories of the Squamish and Lillooet peoples. Um, and we are grateful to be here to be working and living. So uh, in regards to, um, sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> oh, by the way, I also have ADHD, so I live on the neurodiversity side. So then hence why I had to ask the question again. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's absolutely fine, Louisa. So, just following up on, so we obviously know that the, there's progress, which is you know Gina Davis and other institutes are sort of leading on, but at the same time, it's very slow, isn't it? Since Thelma and Louise, which is thirty years old, what are you, what are your thoughts on that? Um, it's been a challenge. I started in the crew side, and I was probably you know I'm still probably one of five Asian women on set. In, the, in my city, you know, which is very uh, disheartening. And and when it comes to women representation on camera or behind the camera, it's been difficult. Um, but in fact, what is it? Uh, I left the industry and came back. And when I came back, it was a female led team. It was a uh, director, which is Patty Jenkins. Hi. <laughs> but it was on um, a TV show again, uh, first AD, production manager and myself. And I was and I looked around and I was like, oh, my gosh, there's it's all women. This is great. Uh, and then, of course, as progress, you know, we see and over time I started doing my own work and stuff. I was like, oh. There's no other people of color and it's and then like my journey kept going and kept going and it was like, oh, I'm still not being seen. I'm not being heard. I'm not getting meetings. I'm not getting opportunities. I'm not getting funding. Uh, and it's, and like, you know, so you do your own work and it's very disheartening, but I see the change coming. We see it on the screen. We just need to see it behind camera as well. Cause be people, women of color will hire more women of color and that's, you know, statistically proven, so. Fantastic. Thank you, Louisa. Uh, Matilda, would you like to um, introduce yourself and, and what are your thoughts on, on that question about uh, change? Um, yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Matilda Feishayo Ibini. My pronouns are she, her. I am a bionic writer um, who writes for stage, screen and audio. Um, and I'm going to visually describe myself. I'm a black woman in her late 20s with silver braids, glasses and uh, a, in a black t-shirt also sat in my wheelchair um yeah why has progress been so slow i feel like there's so many different uh angles um i think uh i mean one there's so many kind of systemic barriers that get in the way before people can even think about aspirations and jobs and what they'd like to do in this industry that um and just speaking from my own experiences as a disabled woman um a lot of the time having to even I spend a lot of time having to justify my existence, just bare minimum, as in whether it's the support I need, whether it's access to um, being able to access um, screenwriting courses or what have you to get the funding to attend courses and the support to, to enable me to not just attend those courses, but to like successfully finish them. And I, I feel like I've uh lost many years of my life to just having to get support in place and having to justify why I want to do this and why I should be allowed to do this um in a way that's taken away from training and career progression and why things have taken longer I remember reading years ago an article maybe it was in the Guardian or something about disabled people in general are around about a decade behind in everything when it comes to education employment opportunities um, just because of all the systemic barriers out there that unfortunately you know we do live in a society in a world that doesn't see disabled people as human so a lot of the time we're having to prove and justify why um, we have a uh, we have rights to exist we have rights to have access to things um, so I feel that's one of the, for me at least, a big barrier is that some of us are just fighting to live, let alone to be able to live and thrive and work and do whatever the hell we want to do. 
Uh, thank you, thank you, Matilda. Thanks for that. And um, and and, the, and then our next panelist, uh, Melanie Hoyes. Um, would you like to um, say a few words, Melanie? Yeah, thanks for letting me go last after all of those amazing points. Um, so yeah, I'm Mel. I am the Industry Inclusion Executive at the BFI, so advocating for change and representation in front of and behind the camera. Um, I'm particularly nerdy about kind of data and, and the ways in which research can move that conversation forward without us having to sort of prove that there's a problem in the first place. Hence uh, my affiliation with Madeline and the amazing work of um, the GD, GDI. Um, I think, oh, to describe myself, I am a mixed race woman of color wearing glasses and red lipstick um, and with some vinyl behind me. Um, I think in terms of why progress, I mean, I echo everything that everybody says. I think that the idea of um, sort of systemic barriers are key. I think the problem is, is that um, unfortunately, and, and especially in the film industry, sort of women are seen as problematic. You know, it's, it's problematic in terms of um, they're often carers, uh, you know, having kind of breaks in the industry, which isn't allowed, you know, you can't not be working um, in a freelance industry. So if you take time out to have a child, like you're essentially kind of hit a glass ceiling and can't get back in, um, you know, having to work long hours, you know, they work, the system works in a way that creates barriers for people to be able to partake because you have to work until the job is done and you might have other responsibilities and often women have those as COVID has shown um, are the bearers of those responsibilities. Um, we were talking to and Andrew Ridesborough about a film that she was making and it was an all-female set and she was like there were job shares and a crash and we worked nine to five and lo and behold made a film in three weeks and so I think there's a real sort of shift up of the culture of the industry which needs to happen to make it so that it doesn't have to be really hard to make a film or that maybe we just need to plan better or do things in a different way we don't have to be working till two o'clock in the morning and everyone's mental health suffering um, because we're just working so hard and I think ultimately um, just to speak to the fact as well that these spaces traditionally and still are not safe spaces especially for women, especially for women of colour or any kind of yeah, minoritised group, um, because of the way in which the system has been built up uh, by men in the majority and by those gatekeepers and those power imbalances mean that actually the behaviours uh, make it very difficult to be a woman in the film industry actually. So I think those are uh, another couple of things as, as well as everything that everybody's mentioned and that's why things are slow because there are some people having a really nice time <laughs> in the industry doing making the films that they want to make um, and not understanding why space needs to be made for anybody else. So um, yeah, that needs to change. I keep on unmuting myself. I was just said absolutely well said. Thank you so much. Fantastic answers. And because obviously this is in this event is inspired by Thelma Louise and it's 30 years old. Have what would you say is the kind of key landmark change that's happened, you know, since Thelma and Louise? And what would you what's your prediction for the I wouldn't won't say the next 30 years but for the next sort of you know five five years or so what's your prediction for the industry so what's the biggest change and what would you predict for the future um should we go in this does anyone in particular want to take that Madeline maybe can I throw that question to you so there's two things there's you know there's on on screen and behind the camera right because our point of view has been that what happens on screen has been mostly unconscious bias because storytellers write what they love or they know. And if it's a five to one ratio of uh, men to women actually writing the stories and having a chance to get their stories on a small or big screen, then of course there will just be less female characters. And what we did see is when we studied the global film market, is that when there was the presence of a female writer or director, there was like a seven to 9% increase in on-screen roles. So, you know, I think the fabulous work, you know, that the BFI does and a lot of the other panelists is really driving that, you know, forward. When it comes to on-screen, you know, we, one of our research tools that we've been using is called Spellcheck for Bias, which is a text-based, uh, tool that allows us to 
break down a script based on characters and dialogue, and it presents opportunities. And then it's really up for the decision makers, uh, the creative executives to decide um, what they want to do with those characters. And it doesn't invade the authentic truth of the storyteller, which is really important, but it's been a great opportunity to more authentically infuse um, diversity and inclusion you know, in, into content. And the other thing that we've seen is all the major studios have now become organizationally ready that they have established very robust and sophisticated diversity, equity, and inclusion departments that sit in the business units. And that has been a dramatic shift, a historical shift over the last three to five years where you now have these incredibly seasoned executives working alongside with the creative executives and, and putting that lens you know, on the content. Um, they're at the table, you know, at the green light table. Um, and that will also help drive forward a lot of these numbers that have been, you know, kind of, kind of stuck. Um, so that's, that's what I'm seeing. And that's where I believe this change will be much more propelled. Um, I would say even in the next two to three years, we'll see um, much more uh, greater change, you know, on screen, the behind the camera is more glacial. And I think, you know, Melanie can certainly you know, talk a lot more about, about that progress. Fantastic, thank you. Actually, Melanie, I'll go to you then because you were uh, name-checked with, uh, with, with progress on that front. Thank you, Madeline. Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely um, been a lot more progress on screen in terms of diversity and inclusion generally. I think people view that as the kind of easy, easy win. Um, but I think what's been really interesting this year as well and kind of looking across the chain of film production through to sort of awards. Um, you know, if you look at the, the scandals that they have been with award shows over the last few years and the kind of changes and the wholesale change that um, sort of BAFTA had made this year in the, at the recognition of, of people like Chloe Zhao and Emerald Fennell and just some really amazing films and not just um, with amazing people behind the camera, but really kind of intricate nuanced uh, female characters on screen. I think that is something that we just haven't seen in a really long time. And I think that is down to the efforts of um, places like the Gina Davis Institute. You know, there are, there are there is movement and that accountability um, has enabled that sense of we're constantly moving forward, um, you know, to sort of dissipate because it's just not true. And in, in research that the BFI had looking at gender, um, since the beginning of film in the in a feature film in the UK, the representation of women on, on screen and off screen was 33%. And it is exactly the same um, up until the launch in 2016. So that, you know, you have highs and lows, you have peaks when um, the men are off to war and that kind of thing. But essentially, the representation stays the same. So I think the data um, gets rid of this idea that so well, I was doing something I hired this like one woman so I'm, you know I'm good I think like the the it gives you a sense of like needing to keep your foot on the pedal and I'm hoping that that um, allows that that kind of annual check-in with the numbers um, will keep pushing that forward and I do think um, you know there has been a consistent effort over the last sort of 10 years or so um, and we are starting to see reap those rewards but I just hope that we don't take our foot off the pedal because it can easily slip back and it has done before. Absolutely and I think um, you know as it was Thalma said wasn't it something's crossed over and we can't you know we can't look back we have to sort of move forward don't we and um, Helen can I uh, go to you for your thoughts on that one? Yeah I mean I, I agree with everything uh, Melanie and Madeline have said so far. I mean I, I think what's what's really fascinating is what didn't change after Thelma and Louise and I know this is something that Gina spoke about endlessly and you've you've even referenced today but you know it, it was this big success it was you know Oscar garlanded and yet there was nothing there was no build on that particularly there was no great change that came out of it and and that's what I've seen over my career this century you know is every time there would be a female-led film 
for years and years, it would be written off as a sleeper hit, you know? Oh, who could have seen Mamma Mia being a hit? I mean, I feel like any woman could have told you that, but okay, but sleeper hit Mamma Mia, sleeper hit Devil Wears Prada, sleeper hit Eat, Eat Pray, Love, you know, one after another, every single year or more, there'd be sleeper hits led by women. And I think what's changed in the past few years is they have started to realize that this is not a series of sleeper hits that no one could have seen coming, that there is a market for more diverse films and that it is not all about, you know, which Marvel Chris are we going to cast this week uh, as the lead of our movie, much as I love them all, except maybe Chris Pratt. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's about trying to be a bit more um, open-minded and about listening to the voices that are now coming through. And I think what's changed now has been, it, the, the Me Too movement has been incredibly important, not just in terms of women speaking out about direct abuse and that that side of things, but also it got women talking behind the scenes. You, he you heard stories about all these actresses having the meetings that led to the Time's Up um, formation. And, and that was really, I think, seismic because it was them talking very honestly in large numbers about the kind of things that had held them all back and that they all had in common. They talked about money, they talked about opportunity, they talked about script development, they talked about working together. That was really important. But obviously the Black Lives Matter movement as well, enormously important. It got people to have these conversations, to be conscious of this stuff. And that is, you know, the first step because I think there was, you know, like I said before, I talked about myths, but there, there has been this tendency to just go, well, that's just not something we can deal with. That's just... I mean, it would be very nice if we were diverse and representative, but that's just not what the market tells us. And what's happening now is people going, no, that is what the market's telling you. You're just not listening. So so that's that's, I think, what's been really, really key in the last few years. And, you know, it, it's it's slow. It's it's incremental and especially behind the scenes. It's incredibly frustratingly slow. But every crack in the dam is really important. Chloe Zhao is really important. You know, Moonlight winning the Oscar was incredibly important. These things matter and they move the needle and they move the, the realm of what's possible and they open it up. And I think that's, that's beginning to add up. That's beginning to make some kind of momentum. But yeah, we have to keep it up. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Helen. And Louisa, what about for you? Because you're a, well, you're a writer and a director. What, um, you know, what's been the biggest change and, and what would you like to see as your sort of predictions for the, for the next five years? Um, the, the, last, the next five years will hopefully be full of like, you know, like what, what Helen was saying in the fact with like Time's Up movement, um, that is like the societal change is the demand, right? That's what really drives media. And so the people with the money see what happens, they will help drive that change because they realize like, oh, they're demanding it. So we have to, it's a business. The film industry and television industry at the end of the day is business. Um, before it was, you know, like they catered to men because that's where the money was, right? Men would pay for everything. Um, now, uh, now it's women and women are, are and other and others in intersectionality. So I think that now that there's an awareness that we're not othered anymore, we, we shouldn't be othered anymore, that our voices are equal and our voices are important and our experiences are different, but, uh, but equal in, in value means that, you know, we'll see great stories that have never been told. You know, I'm tired of seeing the same old guy doing the same old thing. I'd love to see the you know, cool new twist on things. Oh, I never thought that this version of it, I mean, all of the stories are kind of the same at the end of the day, right? But there's different takes on everything, which is why everything's so great and fascinating and fun. Um, and also a lot of organizations now are doing data on intersectional um, like diversities, right? So they're, they're looking into the data and so supporting that work, uh, supporting, pushing, for our opportunities to be heard, to get into the room, to make our films. I mean, I encourage, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm in the lobby of a thing. So if you hear any doors <laughs> opening and closing, you know, so, but I encourage if you have like students or young filmmakers or older filmmakers, cause certainly uh, when Madeline was talking about um, ageism, I mean, I was applying for a BIPOC diversity um, uh, program, mentorship program, but I was disqualified because I was 40 instead of 30. 
well, I'm sorry, but when I was 30, this program didn't exist. And so now I have another barrier that I, that, you know, and so it's, it's, so please like, you know, as people, people who are organizers, open it up to everybody, you know, like really do look at the demographic. Um, Telefilm, which is Canada's uh, government funding, literally like two days ago, finally changed the language requirement because before it had to be more than 50% English, French, or indigenous languages. But Canada, like the States, is like very much a multicultural country, right? I was born here. My friend, her film was mostly Japanese, but it was about a Japanese um, immigrant living in Canada and it was disqualified. And so, and like so many films like that were disqualified. And I was like, and we're all like, wait a second, Canada is a multicultural country. How can you say that we are not Canadian enough for you and not get the funding to make our films and not have our voices represented if we don't demand the change, right? So, so they are listening because they have to. Um, they, you know, we demand it. And so, yeah, that's it. There's some really important points to raise, Louisa, because you're right, and a lot of the um, new opportunities are limited to certain age groups. So it's, you know, it's dismissing the stories for um, for everybody, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, some really, really important points raised there. Um, Matilda. Yeah, I think just I kind of agree with everything everyone said so far. Um, I feel like I could throw into the hat probably social media has been a really interesting uh, tool to be able to um, not just enjoy and talk about the work that we love and, and have uh, watched and what have you, but also interrogate who gets to tell the story. I think more so have I, have I noticed that in the last like maybe five years or so that um, we're now caught with, there's a, yeah, there's a bit of, um, a bit more of an encouragement to like interrogate who is telling this story and why, because for so long, um, essentially like white cisgendered non-disabled men have been telling everyone's stories and yet and yet like to propagate the myth that every writer or every filmmaker has um, has the doesn't need permission they can tell any story that they want when in reality we don't live in that world actually people aren't even trusted to tell their own stories and so I think social media has been really useful in being able to really call things out and call people out on their BS. And um, also the great thing about social media is people who, who haven't, um, uh, wouldn't typically get funding opportunities or platform are able to build um, a platform. They're able to reach audiences in new ways, in ways that they would have, you know, through maybe the mainstream way of filmmaking or what have you, would have been sidelined. So people are able to like find their audiences for their work through social media, through sharing, through all the different platforms and develop an audience. So when they do come to maybe a studio or a company, what have you, they're like, well, I've got all these people that love my work you should probably fund me so I can make even more um, more bigger budgeted work and things like that and take their career to the next level so I feel like social media has played a, a key role in that um, and I feel like for my own career as well in the sense of like the number of opportunities that I found through social media because for some strange reason people might have all these great schemes and scholarships and um, great mentorships but they're so poorly advertised and if you don't see it or if you miss the deadline that's it for that year and maybe next year you're no longer eligible but social media has been such like a lifeline for me to like nab opportunities or to connect with people I normally wouldn't because the world is physically or at least London is so physically inaccessible but I've been able to connect and meet up with filmmakers over zoom or will skype or whatever or dm them on twitter or what have you so being able to reach out and connect with people in in a much uh, more accessible way I think social media has played a really big part in that 
That's fantastic, Matilda. Yeah, really, um, really useful point. And, and that's actually how I came across you as well, I think, through social media. So, uh, yes, it's a great way of sort of opening up opportunities and, and reaching out and seeing, you know, a wider range of people. Because otherwise, the industry, sadly, is still a bit like, oh, I need to find someone really quickly. Where's my mate? Or can you recommend someone? So you, that's, a real, that's a really brilliant point uh, about how we can sort of reach beyond, you know, um, the sort of nepotism nepotism of um of the sort of media industries um i thought we might um go to a couple of questions for a moment and um, holly do you want to um see what what the q a um what's in the q a yeah absolutely um so we've got a couple of questions do keep sending them in guys if you ever if you think of anything and even just commenting on, on what people have said we can bring those up as well um one of the first question is what is your opinion on the diversity of cr the creators themselves so this is anonymous from somebody who's anonymous. Um, they said, so I often see amazing female directors accept awards and the crowd standing behind them is a bunch of white men or the set photos are the director and another group of white men. How, how do we, I think it's meant to be, how do we, how, yeah, sorry. How do we improve diversity in all parts of cast and crew, both terms of gender and race? feel free to, for anybody to jump in on that if anyone would like to. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think we have to remember, and this is where we come back to the systemic issues within the industry. So um, I was recently on a panel with Sarah Gavron and she was talking about her wonderful film Rocks, which they did in a really sort of different way. And um, every, you know, the majority of the crew were women and all women of color. It was completely kind of new cast. Um, and, but she was sort of saying when they did that, and as difficult, some of that was more difficult than it maybe should have been, or she would do things differently next time. But when she was thinking about what she'd done before, she just never thought about it. And, you know, because she, she'd she had those opportunities and she was so grateful for those opportunities and you enter into an industry that works in that way. So often you're sort of thrust into this position um, where you're suddenly a gatekeeper and actually you don't think to do things differently because it's just how it is. And I think there's a lot about our industry where it's like, well, it's just how it is. It's just how we do things. We couldn't possibly, that person's not at the right level. We couldn't possibly do it in that way. It's gonna to take too long. It's gonna to cost too much money. And I think, so we have to remember that sometimes even when people are put into that position that actually it's really difficult. Um, it can be really difficult for them to sort of think outside of that because you've come up in this certain way and um, you're trying to fit in as well. And I think what, but what needs to happen is more of rocks, you know, like we need to just do things differently. And I think when you do get to that position, it's really important to try and push and have an inclusion rider or think about like, look around you. And if everybody is white and male, think about why that might be or what you can do to improve things for next time, because it might not be possible on this production. There might not be the pipeline or the diversity that you want to see in the roles that you want to see. So how is it that we're going to make that better for next time? And I think, you know, part of the point of something like the diversity standards that the BFI has is to have that thinking, is to embed that thinking into your way of working that isn't just replicating the systems that have allowed this kind of mono homogenous culture to occur in film. And I think, so I really think it's about just looking around you and thinking, what, like, is there, what am I doing wrong? Do I have the representation that I want? Could this be better and more interesting and richer? And how are we gonna do that? And I think once you're in those positions, it's easier, but people do forget or they're struggling with their own um, problems in terms of representation or their own discrimination. So they're just trying to get the job done. So I think, you know, you have to remember that sometimes like people that are oppressed get into those positions and, and struggle uh, with their own stuff. And um, so you kind of have to forgive that to some extent, but I do think it is about remembering your power and thinking about how you can do things differently. And that's the only way anything's gonna change. Thank you, that's great. Yeah, go Helen. Yeah, I mean, I just basically want to co-sign that. I've got a couple of examples of exactly that kind of thing um, that I could just give you, just mention. Like there was one uh, director I spoke to who was making an independent film. Really, it was very female focused. It was about a, a sort of love story between two women in the kind of 1950s. And she really wanted all female heads of department. But she also was getting money from Screen Scotland. So she also had to have a certain number of Scottish heads of department. So, you know, you, you get these kind of clashing requ requirements that can be a real issue for some people. Um, you also have situations like uh, somebody on a big blockbuster set that I talked to, a female director, who 
didn't think to ask for a half female crew because that had always just happened on her films before. She had made Australia films in Australia. She had had female producers. They had secured her a half female crew, just as standard. That was pretty much how it worked. And it did not occur to her. And she turned up on set in London and was quite frankly, I think a bit horrified to find that most, almost all of her crew were male. Um, obviously, you know, down the layers, she, she talked about the heads of department and so on. But that kind of thing can happen as well. So again, it's about keeping your eye on the ball at all times. And, and hopefully it will be about incremental change. I mean, the numbers in cinematography and composing are even worse than they are in directing, which is really saying something. So it does take a bit of, of searching at this point, at this moment in time, in some areas. Um, but it's only by searching that we're kind of going to change that picture, I think, and move things forward. And and. A lot of those men you see standing behind women on award stages, those are going to be producers. So that means they're the money people. And the fact that those are all still men, that's a harder thing to change. And it's not something in a director's power for the most part. Yeah, that's yeah, really good point. Louisa, do you, you want to chip in there? Yeah, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, I work as crew as well. I work on some pretty, pretty big shows, including um, most recently on a, a Amblin movie. And it was a predominantly Asian led show but you know while i was on set one day and i'm like i'm so excited to be here i looked at the you know the top corner of a call sheet which shows you the adults as i like to call them right the adults who are the adults on this show and they were all men except for one woman and she was asian but she was part of like the the far away producing team out of new york and she never came to set which is not you know that's just because she was part of the team as and basically you know named so there was like no representation for women on, even though it was like, yay, Asians, like this is an Asian film, cool. There was no actual women above the line in that sense. Um, and again, grateful to be on an Asian show. Also another thing about leadership, I mean, it really does stem from leadership. So it comes from the top. If the, the producers are like, you know what, I'm gonna actively look for or bring up associate producers, um, who are of color or of diversity, then those people will be like, you know what, we're going to make, really make an active effort to hire and search for and get the list of names because every diversity group will have a name, a, a list, a giant list or multiple lists of people who are qualified to do that work, even if they're independent, but they haven't had the chance to break into union world, as it were, then then this is their chance, right? They're like, oh, I have a, you have a huge independent like your reel is amazing. Come work with us. We'd love to offer you da da da. And it's, and it's that it's the top down. And it really is. Um, and w in the documentary, this changes everything. By the way, which is fabulous. And finally on Netflix in Canada. So look for it in your region. Yeah. Um, you know that part where where uh, was it HBO, um, Madeline, where they basically said, oh, we're gonna. Yes. All right. Thank you. Yeah, it was effects. Yeah, they made the change at the top and it changed everything below. And that is so important. But also we at every level need to also be aware to bring people up, um, train those people so that they're ready. Uh, they're in the position now in the leadership stuff. But there's so many of us who are ready, <laughs> we're ready to work and we're so good. Um, and so it's just a matter of giving us the opportunities to do it. I think that's a really great point. I think a question, personal question just to stem on from that is, is do you guys have any um, advice for people early in their career who are joining on to film sets and looking at the lack of diversity, but then maybe feeling intimidated to say anything because they're just trying to get a credit or just it's their first time on a film set and they, you know, it, it's hard to make those statements and say those to the people when you're trying to just get your foot in the door as well. Do you have any advice for that, that kind of situation? Okay. I'm just gonna take it since I'm, I'm on the floor a lot. I like started as a PA and worked my way all the way up to like directing my own stuff. And I'm a, a second assistant director in the DGC and worked on tons of stuff. But um, I will say like, you know, mentoring and, and encouraging, seeking out mentorship, seeking out um, those Facebook groups uh, because you know, we have so many like little tiny groups of support. Um, asking for help. Some people don't have time, but really at the end of the day, we will make the time to help grow our, our you know, representation on set and in front of camera. Um, always happy to, you know, and I've seen it happen and I try to encourage others to do it, that we're, 
always teaching and always learning. So. Great, yeah. Anybody else want to dip in there? Feel free to. No, cool. Okay, no worries. Um, let's see if we've got any other questions. Um, so Nigel has put quite a long one. He's just asking, uh, did any of you see the assistant? I thought it was pretty good on the treatment of women often receive in, uh, in production companies. Uh, did anybody see the assistant? Because this might not be relevant if uh, Helen did. OK, um, so interestingly, her abusive boss is never shown just the impact on the lead character. Interesting how uh, PC production and ad companies have a reputation for bullying. Certainly know of that many friends who have worked in those areas. It's a real problem that people are desperate to work in the creative industry. Young employees, especially women, are very vulnerable to bullying and abuse. I don't know if you've got any particular yeah, comments no, I on that. I mean, I think honestly, it's a fantastic film. Uh, I think it's a it's an incredible portrait of essentially a sort of somewhere between kind of Harvey Weinstein and Scott Rudin kind of a, a story, basically. Um, and it is it's bullying, it's abuse, it's um, uh, it's sexual manipulation at the very least, if not outright rape. Um, and it's pretty much rape in the film, but it's it's off screen. It's not it's not nothing is, is explicit or or you know, um, yeah, portrayed as such. But it is a really I think chilling portrait of the kind of power imbalance that has existed and I think it makes the case you know in the same way that all of the me too stuff if you read it through it all makes the case that we just need more kind of checks and balances we more, need more equality of power you know I think there's been this this myth this built up over years that there are certain people in the film industry who are so special and so irreplaceable and such geniuses that they must be allowed to do whatever they want and everyone else must essentially accommodate them. And I think one of the, the good things about this new era is people are beginning to really question that and, and sort of place more of a primacy on being a decent human being and the fact that there are very talented people who are also decent human beings and maybe we should give them more chances and stop enabling the bad ones because I think people have now seen that there is a reputational and a financial risk to supporting these these bad actors. I think the other thing to mention about that is just that you know um, we sort of have bullying and harassment guidelines, but it's essentially law. <laughs> so like production companies are businesses, they're companies. And yes, they've been, you know, in the main, and especially in the UK, like the, in the independent sector, um, you know, there's people that just wanted to make film and that, you know, be creative and tell the stories that they wanted to make and have some fun doing it. And I think there's a real reluctance to, um, recognize ourselves as a business and sort of so we think as as Helen was saying like we're so special that we just because you know, it will like stunt our creativity and we could possibly and actually what's happened is this sort of awful like toxic culture has built up that just has been allowed to like run free for so many years that and with no accountability whatsoever and I think it's really on in this case you know it isn't on the people in those places you know in those positions of being abused it's not on them actually to do anything about it. it is absolutely the producer's responsibility um, to give pastoral care and make sure the behaviors are good on set um, and that there is accountability if stuff is reported um, and to give you know to, to foster a culture of care on their set and I think that is starting to become um, recognized and I think the sort of peril of court cases you know because ultimately if you don't do that and somebody takes you to court and they're successful in, in purely monetary terms that's going to cost you more money than just putting preventative measures in place but also from sort of a moral point of view like you just you want people to be okay they're, they're under your care they're your employees and I think there's there has to be a shift of understanding for that and it's absolutely that the producers or the managers they are the people in control if they absolutely need to to take control of that situation um, and make it better absolutely yeah, it sometimes feels like there's a sigh or a huff when, when you build up the courage to complain about these things and then it's like you're a burden. Um, Louisa, please take, take go ahead. Well, and again, from like the onset point of view, um, like when all the adults are like yelling and running around and pushing the crew to move faster and, you know, in the rain, in the dark, or in, or in the case of um, Sarah Jones, um, 
you know, a few years ago who passed away because, you know, the adults were saying this, and they weren't supposed to be where they weren't supposed to be, and she ended up dying because of negligence. And thank God that there was actual repercussions, but, um, but it shouldn't have happened. But the good in that is that we, it empowered crew members to speak up because a lot of the times we just go with what the leaders do, tell us to do because we think that they have our best interests in, at heart when in fact they're just doing what their job as well. And so um, sometimes they don't speak up, sometimes they don't make the best decisions. And so now the crew or people below are, t are empowering themselves to actually speak up, to stand up for themselves, to, to call their unions, to call the hotlines, report. Um, and then that forces the, the leaders to actually have leadership skills to actually go and figure out how to be good leaders, how to know the people who used to yell a lot and bully on set, again, top down, not necessarily even the producers, but I'm saying like heads of departments because producers don't necessarily see that. Um, but you know, if you're in a certain department and your department head or somebody is bullying you or being a jerk, like that stuff is no longer acceptable. And so that means that you as a, if you're the head of department, that means that you have to learn how to be a better leader. You have to be a better head of department. And how do you do that? How do you like fix problems, human resource things now? It's not even a matter now of, of just doing your job. Now you have, to, as a head of department, you have to be a leader. You have to uh, human resource manage problems. And that's good because that means that you're aware and can see stuff and can prevent issues from happening and causing irreparable damage and PTSD and, and people who leave the industry because they're so damaged from treatment on set, like breaking people's dreams, right? They, they come in with this like idea that we're making art and fun and making movies and blockbusters and stuff. And then they leave crying and being like, you know what? I never want to participate in this kind of storytelling ever again. And that's such a shame because it's such a great, um, you know, medium to be a part of. Like, you know, when you get a really good team, a really good crew, it's a family, you know, like, I like to talk about Supernatural because I worked in it when I was in season one, right? Come on, nerds, woo! <laughs> but season one of Supernatural, and they went 16 seasons. Now, I left that after season two because of, you know, life and circumstance, but I was still considered family even at to, to the end. Like, I could go onto the lot and, and say hi to everybody and, you know, like borrow equipment to make my own films because they were so generous. <laughs> but things like that, we create family on set, but we can't do that if people are yelling at you. Right, and so better leaders create better work environments, safer work environments, um, and you know those leaders need to be trained, or they need to train themselves or get training, and that's what I that we need to do. Do the thing. I was just thinking, as well as an educator, um, I have the responsibility of film schools to talk about these subjects as well, because I think you know there's often a tendency of oh the film world's brilliant, and yes, you will be doing some you know some crappy jobs for a while, but, um, but it, you know, it's, it's all good. And, you know, you just have to say yes to everything. So, but actually is about questioning that, talking to students about the realities and also, you know, you know, where, where people have stepped over the line, you don't have to put up with harassment and bullying. And I'm really pleased that there's a lot of work going into that in the UK, um, back to the, the union, is doing quite a lot of work and then there's some really good charities as well film and tv charities that are working with people so that they feel like they can um speak out or get support because there's still that fear isn't there that if you if you're seen as a troublemaker you won't get the next job so it's good that you know that um people are talking about these things and hopefully there'll be a change um i mean on that front is is there anything anyone wants to talk to talk to about kind of because everyone's you know working in around the film industry their own experiences of um you know fighting for equality and and um, harassment or any of, of those things that you've you've encountered in your in your worlds um i think i was just going to link back to what everyone has just said in terms of because i think it's so important to highlight that the era of this maniacal creative genius who's actually a predator and abuser is over that era is crumbling it's no longer it, it was never accepted in the first place but it's certainly not going to be accepted today and that when you are starting out find your unions find your peers find your tribe because those people are going to get you through should you unfortunately find yourself in that situation they are your witnesses they are your backup 
like they are the people you will go to and tell this is what happened where you can get some advice where those charities are like back to or those unions or what have you um because when you're starting out we a lot of the time myself included didn't know anyone didn't know who to turn to when you know off things were said to me or whatever like you just kind of kept quiet and thought okay maybe i'm just being a little too sensitive or what have you as opposed to actually that person is out of order um and i think when i think back to like things that i've had to um address and come to terms with i think for the the biggest thing for me is um when I worked for a charity many years ago, the biggest barrier, and it was for a charity that um, supported uh, independent living for disabled people. And the biggest barrier we kept coming up against was attitude that like you can throw as much money, you can throw as much research, but if people don't change their mind, don't change their attitude, the way they think, um, the problems are gonna keep occurring just dressed up differently and I think if people, especially in the industry, if there are people, you know, whether in uh, senior leadership roles or from, you know, as um, or down at the crew level, if they're not willing to change, they should not be employed. I know that's really controversial to say, but like, actually, if you're not willing to work in a different way, if you're not willing to learn someone's pronouns, if you're not willing to be to work in a professional manner that encourages a safe working environment, then you should not be allowed on set. Like, I just I don't understand it. That will put up with your supposed creative genius as well as like your bullying and awfulness um, people make I've I've seen and I know this from experience people make their best work when they feel good when they feel safe and traumatizing people and upsetting them and bullying them like the work will suffer as a result you will see it in the product um, yeah yeah very well said yeah <laughs> Amazing. Amen to all of that. I, I was just going to say in terms of my experience, I mean, look, I'm very privileged. I am, you know, white, cis, straight, able-bodied. You know, I have lots and lots of sort of privileges going for me. Um, but what I've noticed, even just as a woman in film journalism, is is just the lack of thought. Because when I started out, and still now, it's still a minority of women. And there's just this sometimes thoughtlessness. There's just this assumption that a, a straight white male is a human default setting straight white able-bodied cis male is a human default setting and everybody else is a special interest group and so you were always trying to kind of just point out things like just throw away language throw away jokes let's say about football in in a, in a film review and you're kind of going look even our male readers are not necessarily football fans why are we putting this in here which will be more likely to alienate or confuse or just seem irrelevant to our female readers but a lot of these kind of little things in a magazine uh, or a newspaper or whatever just give this impression that this is not for you. You know, this is our stuff. You can't share it. And so even starting from those kind of really minute things can make a big, big difference. Um, but you but somebody has to be there to see that they exist, to speak up about them. There's loads of things I'm going to be blind to because of my privilege. But if there's if there's a diversity of people in the room, somebody can say to me, hang on that sentence is actually really thoughtless or offensive or, or just wrong, you know? And, and if we, if everybody in the room is exactly like me, we're not going to see that. So that's, you know, it, it's just, it's just better to have a wider pool of people. It's just, it makes your art better. It makes your work better. It makes the atmosphere better. It make, makes business sense because it's less likely that you are completely thoughtlessly recklessly going to offend a, a huge slice of the population you know it's just apart from the moral argument it's also the sensible argument like i don't understand why anybody has an issue with it. like sometimes i'm just sitting here going why 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 is this bad this is obviously good just do it um so yeah anyway so I, i've experienced a lot of that kind of thoughtlessness being left out being considered other being only sent to review the rom-coms or the kids films for some reason I don't have kids yet but like I get sent to the kids films anyway you know th that kind of thing because I'm the girl in the room therefore they're for me you know um whereas I actually really like sci-fi and superheroes and all the rest and supernatural oh my god it's amazing <laughs> 
Thank you, Helen. That's fantastic. And I think as well, it's, it's, it doesn't have to be as hard as some people make it out to be. These things that we're asking for are not complicated things. They're not difficult processes to put in place. So um, if we, absolutely. If we changed up our working for COVID in one week, yeah. for years we've been talking about how difficult diversity is, how hard it is to make change. In one week, we were all working from home on our computers in these little squares like doing things differently putting on online events it is not that hard to make a change in this way you just have to do it yes definitely definitely um lucy did you have any other particular questions the chat is in should we should we have a look at the questions in the chat let me just see um neve was asking if there are any um unions in the uk uh when you're very early stage of your career um back to actually um neve uh, you can get um sort of like entry level um rates so they base it on you know the, the salary so as you work your way up through the union you would um you'd pay a bit more so definitely worth having a look at back to and i can put that in the chat with a link um to them i don't know if anyone else knows of any any others but that's that, that's the main one in the uk um I'm just having a look at some of the other questions. I mean, um, Nigel has asked about video games. Uh, they're a bigger box office, uh, the movies. How about representation on them? I don't know whether anyone wants knows much about video games or wants to say anything about that. Uh, just uh, there is a lot of work. So the BFI is actually um, sort of looks at, even though we're the film institute, we look at the screen industries more generally. So we do look at video games and stuff as well. So there's quite a lot of work. The lead body for games in the UK is Yuki, and they're doing quite a lot of work, especially around female representation, because there there is actually uh, quite a hefty slice of female representation in video game making oh, this is how good I like know about that stuff but um but there are you know there are some like techie nerdy girls who like work in in that space and so there's there's been quite a concerted effort more recently from Yuki to kind of look across that and the intersections of that diversity so there's quite a lot of work so there is some research out as well around um uh, some data around the kind of representation so I think it, it, you know as usual there's a lot of work to do it is quite a male dominated space but there are um some movement and it, over the last couple of years it's quite an interesting space yeah and we actually on uh, July 22nd at around 1 30 uh Pacific time uh, Gina's doing a session at the game developer conference because we're going to be publishing our first ever video game study and we have seen um, a tremendous disparity in terms of uh, representation of uh, not only female characters but you know across all the intersections um, you know of, of race and ability um, we've looked at three things um, the top gamers on the twitch platform which is the largest online gaming platform. We've looked at, we did an analysis of the top games and what's in those games. And then we also looked at the comments that people are making in the chat rooms. So, um, so stay tuned July 22nd, uh, and then we'll have that study um, out there as well. But uh, it's, it's quite shocking. There's a, there's a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done in the gaming industry. Um, sorry, I just very quickly, I'd add, I've done a fair bit of work with a VFX festival here in the UK, which obviously overlaps somewhat with the gaming industry. And there has been, again, big progress made, but from a starting position of almost no women. So uh, it's still a very, very slow kind of road to, to even up the score. There is still the perception of the, you know, the male coder or the male the male um, art, uh, VFX artist. And that is beginning to change. It really is. If you look at the, the students that come to those conferences, it's it's pretty much 50 50 or getting close to it but at the, at the higher levels it's tough and the the industry industry kind of um atmosphere and way of working it's, it's kind of what uh, what louise has been talking about melanie's been talking about matilda's been talking about all of you have been talking about which is that this idea of like a work-life balance again is also very very difficult to achieve they're also using long hours crunches before big releases things like that so there's a lot of kind of cultural stuff that also probably needs to be addressed to get a bit more close to parity 
Great, thank you so much, Helen. I think we've just got one more question from Rachel and then we'll go to final thoughts. Um, so we'll run over just a few couple of minutes. But Rachel's question is quite interesting. It's quite long, but I've just read through it and it's just around education. And I think that's what everything that we've started talking about it always starts there and especially with uh, people early in their career. Um, and just uh, it might be a question for you, Lucy, or anybody else who's any in educate been working in education at all about um, kind of diversity training within education and and are students given that training in terms of like being open to who they're being put into a group with to make a film and being accepting of other people. I don't know if anyone wants to make any comments on that. I mean, at um, LSBU, we embed the BFI diversity standards, so we we make sure that's part of the curriculum. So when they're making a film, they are aware of that, because obviously that is industry standard as well. Uh, we're also doing the same thing with sustainability as well, which, you know, they need to know ab about those things. So that's sort of how we do it. And um, I mean, and it's about people often want to form cliques, don't they, and, um, and work, you know, with people that they feel, you know, look or seem similar to them so it's about breaking that down and um you know get setting up different types of groups and then also talking talking about um you know where people might come from and and um just tr trying to sort of as part of the introduction to higher education but then also talking about the importance of the changing change in industry so that people are aware of aware of that and sometimes um you know some people are quite reluctant um to do that and and it's you know sometimes you have to have go there with difficult and um, challenging conversations but you know it's it's really important because obviously if we can't tackle that within um film education then we're releasing people who are just going to replicate uh, the the things that we don't you know we don't like about the, the industry already yeah absolutely i think that's really well put yeah louisa um i would ask like you know um you know, educators to like invite others <laughs> into the room, like as speakers, as guests, to join, to invite them to panels like this and others, um, because you know that 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 idiom of like if you can see it, you can be it is so true. If they can see that you know there are amazing women like Gina Davis who can do so much work for women, um, they can do and represent and bring up their group um, if they feel you know um, like underrepresented. Uh, sometimes it's hard to be like part of the group that is leading and being the representation and you have to be, you know, like, you know, the, the standard or you're, you know, like, what is it? Um, there's a couple of comedians who are like, or Jimmy O. Yang, who says like, you know, thank you so much for re representing Asian people. And he's like, well, I'm Asian, so I can't really change that. <laughs> but at the same time, he's made so much progress. And so, yes, it, it's a, both a compliment and a little bit confusing. And yes, we are kind of presented in this, you know, literal frame of, uh, but it's important that we step up and, and hold the space for each other. Uh, and doing that by inviting uh, others to educate younger people um, is one of those wonderful things that we can do um, to do that. Yeah, and yeah. I think just to add in terms of the BFI, that there's, um, we have an education department, so we are kind of linked into um, areas of education, but quite a lot of the work that I do and some of the research that I've done around um, representation, um, I've done like the tour of, <laughs> of universities and do talk about that work to kind of highlight, um, you know, the problems with representation in the industry and always get asked inevitably the question of like, well, what do we do? That is different and it's exactly that you know it's kind of looking around you and like thinking am I just working with my friends are they do they look exactly the same as me as am I telling the most interesting story that I can tell um you know making sure that you're networking with people that aren't like you and 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 working with them and I think um it's a really sort of simple thing but it's something that we that that doesn't get talked about or, or sort of mentioned so I do I think it's really important and it's part of the reason like part of my role is academic outreach because I think the children are our future and that you know <laughs> it's up to them to do things differently and they can and will change things you know they will absolutely thank you um Madeline has to go so I just was wondering if we could go to you for final thoughts and just if you have any words of inspiration before you go that would be lovely to hear for our audience well I mean I would just say we all do have a voice and I agree with Matilda that you know social media you know has has kind of leveled um 
of, of being able to communicate. Number two, given digital platforms as artists and content creators, you're not reliant on <clears throat> the traditional system of getting your work shown. And I think as executives and allies, um, no action is an action. And I think we have to um, be very cognizant of staying silent is an action. It's not in action. So we all have to, you know, speak up and, and support and be allies for these changes to be systemic. We don't want it to be flavor of the day, which I think is what we're all, we've all been talking about. So I'm so sorry I have to go everyone, but- Thank you so much. It was so great to see you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thanks Madeline. Thank you so much, thank you. Great, okay. Well, I think unless anybody has got anything desperately they'd like to say, I think we'll go to final thoughts from everybody. Um, on my screen, I can see Louisa first. So if you'd like to go first and just the same again, so any words of inspiration for the audience or thoughts, it'd be great. Yeah, um, stay curious, right? That's my one of the biggest things. Sorry, there's a vacuum cleaner going behind me. I don't know if you can hear that, but stay curious. Don't be afraid. You know, like a lot of, I think what Helen was talking about was that there's, um, you know, like, why do we keep doing the same thing or, and it's out of fear. And so like, but there's nothing to be afraid of. We're, we're, we're humans, we're people, um, with different experiences and different, different, uh, everything. And, and it's only going to feed your stories and storytelling and your experience as people, the more compassionate and curious and fun we are, you know, the, the better our work will be and our, our lives will be. Brilliant. Absolutely. I couldn't have said it better. Melanie, please. Um, I mean, I think don't view inclusion as a risk, view it as an opportunity. Um, I think far too often we think about the kind of negatives or the more work it's going to be or like, oh, it's something else that we're going to have to do. Um, and actually, if everybody did it, it would be better for everybody and just kind of, you know, if everybody was treated nicely, that would be nice for everybody. So I think view that as an opportunity to do things better and to make your workplace better and your creativity better. Um, and I think, yeah, make different choices, bring people with you when you can network to hell, because that is what the industry is based off of. So like everyone else does it, you should too. Um, yeah, that's it. I, that's it. I've got no more inspiration. Okay. <laughs> uh, that was very inspiring. Thank you. Matilda. Um, yeah, just to echo what everyone said, really, like, I don't think I'd still be in this industry if I didn't think change was possible. And like, one of the things that I fell in love with, not just film, but storytelling in general, is that a lot of the time, um, struggles can seem insurmountable. But actually, like, uh, it's about finding your support network. It's about finding the strength within you to keep going that, um, especially in this industry, your career sometimes won't ever look like anyone else's and that's okay. And that doesn't make your career any less than. Um, and that like, yeah, I feel like other than like, just literally keep going your voice, th this industry needs your voice and, and your voice is valid and does need to be heard. So fight every with everything you've got to make sure you get heard. Absolutely, 100%. And Helen? I mean, yeah, all, all of that. I mean, the, the, the big the big thing is that, you know, we've we've started the fight. We, we just have to keep keep doing it and keep pushing. The, the one thing I'd add is that, you know, so I started th this book thing that I wrote, I started looking back at the very dawn of cinema and literally one of the very first people ever to make a narrative film was a woman. She may have been the first, of course, men argue with that, but they're gonna. Um, you know, women have been there since day one. Women have wanted to make films since day one. This is not a new thing. This is not a fad. This is not a trend. The only difference is now we're beginning to make an impact again in a way that really in numbers that we haven't since the silent era. So it's taken about a hundred years to get back to where we were in like 1917, but we are at least back to that point and we might be able to get further this time, you know, because now we have the vote. So I, I really, I am optimistic. I do think things are changing. I think the right conversations are happening and the right kind of questions are being asked and people are beginning to change their minds and they just have to follow that up with action and concrete change. And it's gonna take some time, but I do think we're moving in the right direction. I really do. 
yeah absolutely I agree with you completely all right then I think we'll wrap it up there because we are seven minutes over sorry team um but thank you so much I think all of the points it was worth uh, worth it um and it's been an excellent talk and I feel like I could sit here all evening and carry on the conversation just a big thank you to our panelists um we spun this around really last minute so thank you for giving up your time and talking today these conversations are so important to keep having um, and thank you to our audience for coming and asking questions. That's really um, useful as well. Just a reminder to do um, tweet about it, please. I think the Twitter was up at the top there. Please um, uh, find that again and make sure to tweet about it. And we're using the hashtag Thelma Louise 30. Um, but also we do have a couple of great um, events happening tomorrow, two masterclasses, one of which Louisa is running. Um, so that's going to be um, tomorrow uh, afternoon and evening. Um, so please do sign up to that. There are still safe spaces available. So that would be excellent. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, you, and have everyone. a good rest of your night. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.